All right, everybody. Welcome to the Monday live stream. And just like uh, Frankie V says, it's going to be a lot to go over. So let's just jump right in. So just like the title and thumbnail suggest, it is amazing just how far ahead we are. And I actually was wrong because when I did this uh, to take a look at the uh, bottom to the ROI to where we're at right now compared to previous cycles, it was uh, right on line. And I didn't realize this until this was actually reported to me. So we're going to go over a couple of things. Then we'll talk about uh, Pavel Durov, Telegram. We'll talk about Kraken and the uh, court case going forward with the SEC. And we'll also talk about how El Salvador is essentially winning and a little recap for Senator Elizabeth Warren. So first things first, this was from Rhino Bitcoin app. And they make it very clear. They go, let's take a look at how the first two spot ETFs in the U.S. performed. And we've been talking about this, you know, for months now. Well, actually not months. I mean, Ethereum's only been like a month or so, but uh, with ETF for Bitcoin, definitely. ETH flows are negative 460 million. Bitcoin flows are plus 2.8 billion. And we're going to take a look at is just, is this correct? Because we always want to verify these things. And the second thing, does it really make a difference in price? So we're taking a look at far side investors, Ethereum ETF flows. And yes, I mean, we've seen it that unfortunately, Grayscale in millions, you know, 9,199, They've got a boatload of Ethereum that they will not stop dumping for quite some time. Now, for the Bitcoin ETF, they did a really great job, but there was inflows from the other institutions that were buying them up like crazy, and that's just really not happening. I'm not a, and I'm not saying that Ethereum is awful or it's bad. I'm just saying this is just the facts and these are the numbers. And we need to see that because of Ethereum and their dumpage, that we're still at negative 465. This is the total flows. But if we take a look again, uh, take a look at heyopala.com, we're actually at an all-time high for net flows for Bitcoin itself at 301,000. We just crossed 300, I want to say last Friday, or 23rd. Uh, and now we're coming up to today, whatever it actually is, and we're at that peak level. So all these things that we're talking about, you know, we think to ourselves, well, is there really a difference? And uh, if you take a look at it, that uh, not really. I mean, uh, Bitcoin over 24 hours is down uh, negative 2.4% or somewhere around there. And if we take a look at Ethereum, I mean, recently we can see that, uh, yeah, there is a little bit of a difference as far as like price appreciation. So when I take a look at this, I'm just thinking to myself, well, you know, how is it? Uh, you can see that even though we have some major inflows for Bitcoin and there's a... Uh, reduction with Ethereum, it's not like it's the end all be all. It's just one of the metrics that we take a look at as far as ETFs. So with that, we can also take a look at the rest of, uh, of our market in the top 10. Oh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Tron for hitting into the top 10. Congratulations, all you Tron holders. You're up 16% over seven days. Now there's some other ones that have been uh, better, but hey, you're in the top 10. Congratulations. Dogecoin at nine, Stake the Ether, XRP still up there. And unfortunately, TonCoin slipping by 21% in seven days, 9% in 24 hours, and almost down 1% for the hour. So they will probably keep dropping. Cardano will probably move above TonCoin. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Avalanche doing well. Chainlink still doing well. Everything's going. And that's the whole power of diversification. So we have that. But that leads me to this part. How are we doing so far? as far as like an ROI since the bottom. And this was actually coming to us from uh, Bitcoin Magazine Pro. It used to be called Look Into Bitcoin, but I guess they sold out, and which is fine. Hey, I'm not, this is free market. And now it's called uh, uh, Bitcoin Magazine Pro or Bitcoin Magazine Pro actually took them over. You can still go into Look Into Bitcoin and, and, and see these charts for free. But it states Bitcoin is still outpacing its previous two cycles. Are we actually going to see diminishing returns? Well... I mean, not really. We're actually doing pretty damn good. And then to verify this information, I take a look at Ben's site into the cryptoverse. And if you go there and just take a look at the ROI after the cycle bottom. So the cycle bottom was November, right? November 2022. That's when we bottomed out for the cycle. This would be cycle five as uh, dictated by into the cryptoverse here. And so far, the ROI has been 4.4x. Pretty good. I mean, when we actually were down to, what is it, uh, 17,777, somewhere around there, uh, something something ridiculously low. And then we jumped up to 73,000. So we're way ahead, but this is what we're looking at right now. So we've had a lot of chop, kind of boring. 
And thanks to uh, J-PAL and uh, the, the potential of cutting rates, now we're having a nice little, little baby bull run. But if we overlay the market cycle four, which the bottom or that bottom, just taking a look at 2018 to the top of 2021 and overlay market cycle three as well. Actually, no, not yet, not yet. But we can see that when I did this last time, this was in, uh, we did this on July and I was talking about how it was right in line and that was it. And then of course it peaked and then we come together. But right now, as of today, I'll be damned. It's not way ahead. We're looking at 3.301 versus 4.06. So yeah, we're still ahead, but it doesn't mean anything. We've got a long way to go. But what do you notice here? Going up and to the right. And there's going to be peaks. There's going to be troughs. It's going to feel like everything's going to keep going up forever. And then we'll see a drop. And then we'll have this massive bull run, maybe. Who knows? I can't tell you what it is. And then we'll drop off the face of the planet and everybody will say this is the worst thing ever and it's a scam and it'll go up again. It just keeps repeating. And then if we take a look at the last, the cycle before that, going back to 2015, which was pretty good. Look at this ROI. Now that's what I'm talking about. So if they're talking about diminishing returns potentially, but I personally think we will be somewhere between the last cycle which is I still say we got screwed out of a proper bull run thanks to the FTX, Voyagers, Celsius, and BlockFi's of the world. Not to mention the three arrows capital and the Luna nonsense that happened that. And you can also thank SBF for screwing over Luna and causing them to collapse. I still believe that to be true. And because of that, there was too much shenanigans and we didn't hit our full potential. 2015, 2000 to uh, 2000, yeah, 2015 to 2016, you can see it. I think we'll still be somewhere in between here. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. I still say we've got a pretty good amount to run, but it can't all be good news. And this just came across oh, about a couple hours ago. And I said something on this tweet, incorrectly, I might add. Uh, Pavel Durov, uh, co-founder of Telegram, officially charged with 12 counts. And I said, is this Telegram and Ton Blockchain the Ripple XRP moment? I don't know if it is, but take a look at this. First of all, he wasn't officially charged. I was incorrect on this one. This was a press release, the prosecutor of the French Republic. And they're stating that this is, of course, the 26th of August. Press release, Pavel Durov, founder and CEO of instant messaging platform Telegram, was arrested on the airport 24th of August, blah, blah, blah. This measure comes in context of a judicial investigation to open the 8th of July following a preliminary inquiry initiated by Section 13, the fight against cybercrime of the Paris Public Prosecutor's Office. The judicial investigation was opened against the person on charges of. Before I go into this, this does not make any sense to me. If you have an active judicial investigation as of the 8th of July and you land your private jet on that same country, in that same country, on Saturday the 24th of August, and you knew that it was actually happening, why the heck would you go back to France when there's an active investigation going on? This makes no sense to me. It's not like Pavel Durov is like a moron. So when I see these things, I'm like, this does not, this just does not add up whatsoever. But let's take a look at the charges. And I want you to notice of the word, complicit, complicity. He is complicit. It doesn't mean that he did these things. He is complicit on these charges. And this is just the investigation. The judicial investigation was open against person on charges of. There's not been official charges, but this is what they've been investigating. Complicity, web mastering and online. I don't know what that is. Web mastering an online platform in order to enable an illegal transaction. Refusal to communicate at the request of the authorities. Complicit in possessing pornograph pornographic images of minors. Complicit, meaning it was on his platform. Does this happen on other platforms? I'm pretty sure it does. It's not saying that he's doing it, it's saying on the platform it is. And before I go on, let me ask you a question. If this is happening right now, which we know it is, why doesn't this happen with WhatsApp? And what does it happen with, with Facebook? And why doesn't it happen with uh, what's going on over there? Because it seems like with Mark Zuckerberg, 
you would think that he would also be complicit in these types of things. The other reason why he's not is because he sold your data. He sold your data to the highest bidder. You know how I know that? Because when I was in marketing for other businesses that I was involved in, in my own business, I would buy Facebook ads in the very early days because it actually had a great ROI. Now it's just ridiculously awful, uh, highly overpriced. And I could, I could focus in on a, let's say that I wanted to sell a specific product to a lady with the first name of uh, Mary who walked with a limp and had two kids and made under $45,000 and had interest in bakering and pottery and cats or whatever. I could do that. You know why I could do that? Because I got sold that data and that's how it was. And Telegram, that's not how it works. And I think that's the one of the bigger differences. Also, I'm still pretty sure that they can still monitor you on Facebook and Instagram and all those other places. It's very odd how that actually works, but that's where we're at. So anyhow, complicit, acquiring, transporting, possessing of narcotic substances, complicit, offering, selling, and making available tools, programs, or data designed for or adopted to get access to and damage the operation of an automated data processing system. You can look at uh, uh, Apple, Apple App Store and the Google Play Store for that too. Criminal investigation with a view to commit a crime, five years or more of imprisonment. And there's some other stuff over here. Uh, group offenses, cryptology service aiming to ensure confidentiality without certified declaration, which he does makes a good point. Pavel says, look, if I'm going to encrypt it for, you know, these people, do you, you know, for the normal masses, how can I not have that for the other people? It's up to you. To, that's up for, for you to figure it out. I'm not going to give you everything. Anyhow, and it keeps going on and then it talks about how he's complicit. So that's where we're at with this. And it's just probably going to get worse. So there is one other things to note here, which is I like to see how people come out and support what's going on. This is from Lex Friedman, great podcaster, very interesting gentleman. He says, the arrest of Pavel Durov is a disturbing attack on free speech and a threat not just in Telegram, but any online platform. Governments should not engage in censorship. This is a blatant and deeply troubling overreach of power. Elon Musk pretty much says the exact same thing. And on and on and on it went. So that's what's going on with Pavel Durov for in Telegram. Let me just think about that in the comment section. Again, uh, I've been uh, pretty vocal on my on my uh, likeness for for the ton of cryptocurrency in Telegram, the app itself. But just so you know, it's probably going to keep falling. And it's up to you to decide what you want to do with that information. Anyhow, let me show you what you're going to do. And lastly, well, not lastly. There is one, one more bad piece of this. <clears throat> the SEC lawsuits against Kraken is going to keep going forward. This was actually covered by us a couple of days ago. A uh, metal lawman said, look, it's very hard to dismiss a case in the initial parts of discovery before the case actually goes to trial. So this is going to go to trial. The SEC might lose, but uh, do they ever really lose? I mean, they, they keep taking losses, right? But they keep bringing these cases into court. And uh, the only one that really hurts is through the investor. And of course, there are uh, numerous amounts of, uh, I think it's 11 now, of uh, specific cryptos and digital assets that are named as securities contracts. One of those being Algorand, Decentraland, or Mana, Solana, and like seven other ones. So we'll see how it goes out, but it's just another, another blip in the road. Congratulations, Gary Gensler. You're doing a great job of slowing down innovation. That's just how it works. But this is what I wanna get to. There is some good news. There's some good news out there. I mean, besides the fact that we're way ahead as far as ROI. I do get worried, though, about free speech and how it's kind of being trampled on. Anyhow, maybe we should just move to El Salvador. So El Presidente Naim Bukele says El Salvador is not only the safest country in the Western Hemisphere for different data points, but we also guarantee that you won't be arrested, censored, or have your assets seized for exercising your right to free speech. And there's no property tax. I got to tell you. This is looking pretty good. Might have to take a look at El Salvador, but uh, who knows? And Elon Musk uh, chimes in, says that's pretty damn good or awesome. And then Simon Dixon, who sat down with El Presidente, says, saying no to the IMF and yes to Bitcoin is the type of move I want to see to believe that a country really believes in freedom to build freedom technology. And I couldn't agree more. So well said, Simon. I like to see these uh, positive events, but... Uh, it seems like everything's just eroding here in the United States. It's not, I, it's just like not the country that I remember. 
just I just don't recognize it sometimes, a lot of times. And um, this little clip here, we had talked about this yesterday in, in the Q&A, and it was uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, was talking to Vernon, uh, and uh, they were going over uh, price gouging laws and price fixing laws, and and Joe really took Elizabeth Warren to the woodshed and said, that's ridiculous. And what you're quoting makes absolutely no sense. It was about an egg company, how it had an 800% increase. He said, because of the way they were doing accounting from one quarter to the next, it looks like they had 800%, but over the long haul, it actually wasn't. It was, it was a great one. We went over that Q&A. But here he has Vivek come in and he asked him the same question. And Vivek gives a great answer. So I just wanted to finish it off with this, that there's not, there's good people out there. They're trying to do good things. So let me have you take a listen. It's about a minute or so. I do like these ones. And I got to give it to Joe for really putting out here. So anyhow, take a listen to this. About a minute and a half or so. Let me turn up the volume. I'm like this, Vivek, watching what's coming out, whether it's raising the rate on, on uh, corporate taxes or uh, going up to, uh, what, 45% close to on, on capital gains for certain individuals. Um, it's a lot of populism, but most people that defend it say, ah, she doesn't really mean it. It'll never happen. Yeah, so that's the irony here, Joe. And first of all, I agree with my friends at the Washington Post who observed that if you don't want your opponent to tag you as a communist, then maybe your first policy should not be a bunch of price controls in the United States. We've seen price controls fail in every other major country that's tried it. Argentina, Venezuela, under Hugo Chavez, under Nicolas Maduro. The irony in Venezuela is that you actually saw undernourishment increase tenfold over the same period where they enacted price controls in the food industry, in the grocery industry. Yet that's exactly what they've proposed here. And I do think that this, the fact that this was her signature economic unveiling says a lot about where her vision actually is. To borrow Tim Walls' expression, Joe, if I may, it is just plain weird for them to focus even on the grocery sector if they were going to implement price controls, because this is a sector in which you look at the profit margins of Kroger or Albertsons, you're looking at 2%, 1% profit margins. I saw that interview that Elizabeth Warren did with you, and I respectfully disagree with her. But she even brought up examples like Kraft Heinz or Cal Maine. The reality is their profit margins are lower today than they were in 2015 to 2016. So, yes, it is a just plain weird fixation. Nah, so that's pretty much it. I appreciate those answers. Man, I wish Vivek was actually running. I would have, well, I still couldn't vote for president, so it doesn't really matter. And that's it for today. So, look, everybody, if you like today's video, Give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. And uh, if you got to take off, take off. I appreciate you. Now, if you want to go over and do a little Q&A, probably the best part of the show. We'll uh, do that and uh, we'll get out of here. So thanks for stopping by.